Michael. Thank you, James. Yeah, it's a, it's a big pleasure for me to talk today, especially at um, Iowa State, since a part of this work is done with in collaborations with in, with James and with Xiao Yang, who is now at Argonne. Um, so I will be talking today about um, simulating relativistic field theories in the front form. And uh, here is a brief, brief outline of my talk. I will give a short introduction on quantum computing will introduce the front form formulation of QFT. And then there will be two big chapters, one about um, ab initio simulation of QFT that's likely to be available um, um, in relatively far future when we have access to fault tolerant quantum computers. And then we'll talk about near term applications and what we can do on uh, existing machines. And then I will wrap up and talk about our plans Yes, and also within the stock, um, as I say here, I will use, uh, I will interchange freely adjectives, front form, light front, light cone, they will all refer to, to the same thing. All right, so um, let's begin with uh, talking a bit about quantum computers. So I'll take here a very broad definition of what a quantum computer is. It's basically some programmable device, um, which, uh, base quantum logic or rather than uh, the binary classical logic. Uh, so that's sort of a definition similar or you can say stolen from Richard Feynman. Now by quantum computation we mean doing calculations using such a machine and there is a subclass of quantum computation which is quantum simulation and by this I mean uh, doing computations related to um, quantum physics. So it seems pretty natural to use uh, quantum computer to um, calculate processes in quantum physics. And this was the original Richard Feynman's proposal, but it's also important that there exist uh, numerous applications, potential applications of quantum computers outside of quantum physics and say prime factoring are probably the most uh, well-known of them. So whenever you see a venture capitalist in the street, it's very important to remind them that, yeah, we have so many potential applications of quantum computers in, in all, the, all the fields of technology. So VC stands for venture, venture capitalist now. I exactly, know. yeah. Okay. <laughs> yeah, so, but I would, like speaking seriously, I think that quantum simulation is a very promising application for near-term devices because most applications which go beyond quantum physics, they typically require uh, a lot of qubits. All right, so let's talk about the building blocks of quantum computers. Um, the, the way the elementary, um, uh, let's say piece of information, the elementary block of a quantum computer, the analog of a classical bit is a qubit, which is just a two level quantum system, such as say um, electron spin. And we have um, a whole bunch of these qubits and they all are uh, identical distinguishable quantum systems so we can enumerate them. And uh, a pure state of this quantum system is just a, a vector in a two to the n uh, dimensional Hilbert space. Um, and of, of course, as usually we have this normalization condition on amplitudes and we ignore the, the overall phase. And uh, so far what I was saying was a purely theoretical construction. And uh, the algorithms that we develop, they are sort of agnostic to the hardware realization of quantum computers. And they exist numerous realizations, superconducting, photonic, topological qubits, uh, trapped ions, cold atoms. And uh, it is not clear at all which technology is, is better. It, it's an open question. They are, they are competing. And it's very likely that certain platforms may work better for different applications. Now, uh, so we encode the information in, in qubits, but we also need to process the information and we do it by applying gates to qubits. So gate um, in the most general setting is just an arbitrary unitary operation that you can apply to this vector in the two to the n dimensional Hilbert space. So it's just a matrix of size two to the n by two to the n. Um, in practice, we typically use gates which act on a very small number of factors in the uh, tensor product state. 
uh, typically um, gates acting on one, two, maybe three qubits. So here's just one example. A C naught gate is a gate acting on two qubits. So it acts in this tensor uh, product of, um, of individual qubits. It's just acting on, on two of them and acts trivially on the rest of them. And its action on these two qubits can be um, defined in multiple ways as a matrix or just as its action on basis vectors as an equation for. We oftentimes use circuit representation um, in quantum computing. So this picture you see, you should read it from left to right. So we start from a state initialized. So it's a four qubit states. All four qubits are in the so-called zero state. Or if you, if you have say realization in terms of atoms, you would say ground state or spin up, spin down, whatever. And then you start applying gates. So you go here from left to right. And if we write this evolution as an equation, equation five, then you would read this from right to left as, as usually. So gate u naught potentially acts on all four qubits, and then u1 acts on first two, and h acts on fourth, and so on. And then the last stage of quantum computation is the measurement. And in this gate based model, we typically deal with a projective measurement. So we just measure each qubit and the measurement is zero or one. And uh, typically, even if your measurements are not projective, they can be reduced to these measurements by introducing ancilla qubits or modifying your calculation slightly. So it's a fairly uh, valid assumption, I would say. Um, now I want to introduce a few more uh, definitions. Can I yep. ask, can we think of the qubits as a bunch of boxes with Schrodinger cats in them? Sort of, yeah, very, very naive picture would be like, so dead alive, yeah. And, and they all, uh, they, a bunch of entangled cats. So it's a real mess. I, I, I would say, yeah, just, I, I, maybe the easiest would be just a system of one dimensional spins just a spin chain would be um, also a valid, um, a valid way to, to imagine them. Um, so an important term that we, that we use is quantum advantage. So basically quantum advantage is a situation in which it would make sense to use um, quantum computer instead of classical computer. And typically it is a situation in which we have some problem and the classical resources, classical computational resources are required to solve this problem. They grow exponentially in problem size. So this can be memory or computational time, a number of classical operations, any of these. And here I'm, I'm talking about the best known classical solution. And I, I say best known because we are oftentimes uh, especially in uh, practical applications like in industry, we're dealing with problems for which there is no sort of no go theorem. We don't know whether the optimal solution exists and what, what the solution is. There's just that we have the best known solutions, say uh, the um, integer factoring, the prime, prime factoring problem. We, the, we, like everyone can try to make, make up a better algorithm. Okay, and so, but in the, situation of quantum advantage. The second ingredient is that if we try to solve the same problem using a quantum computer, then in this case, all the quantum resources scale, scale polynomially with problem size. And probably I should also say in both cases, problem size and precision, desired precision. Um, and in, in the case of quantum computation, these resources are qubits, gates, and additionally, we also have measurements because any quantum computation is probabilistic. So we always do um, a lot of repetitive measurements and their number should also scale polynomially with our, the input. And it turns out that simulating general multi-particle systems is one of such problems where we may um, get a quantum advantage, right? Because in a multi-particle quantum system, the Hilbert's uh, space um, dimension grows exponentially with cutoffs. So in quantum chemistry, we would say that dimension of Fox space grows exponentially with the number of orbitals. In QFT, we would say that it grows exponentially with the, the momentum cutoffs up to discretization or with lattice size, right? But to simulate such systems on a quantum computer, we only need polynomially many resources. 
and the ultimate goal of our work. So if we had access to a large quantum computer right now, we would probably do ab initio quantum simulation. So starting from standard model Lagrangian, we would just try to get the full hadronic spectrum, cross sections, decay constants, everything. And um, we cannot do this right now, but since this is our long-term goal, we'll be slowly getting there. And we are also trying to come up with some algorithms for near terms, something that we could uh, run these days. Okay, probably I should comment on uh, quantum supremacy uh, because many of you uh, may have heard of this. So have we achieved quantum supremacy? Uh, the answer is yes, we, we achieved it. Uh, it may be not exactly what you think. So it's definitely something very cool. It's an important milestone. Uh, but the fact that we, so, so what quantum supremacy means is that there exists some benchmark problem that we can solve efficiently on a quantum computer, but we cannot solve um, efficiently on a classical computer. Now here, the key word is benchmark problem. So not necessarily this problem is something useful in the common sense. So it may be generating some weird probability distribution, but not some uh, calculation that can be helpful in industry or in, in science. So, so right now, we reached quantum supremacy and current devices, they have something like oh, 40 or 50 to 100 qubits with at most maybe thousand or two gates. And this is enough to reach quantum supremacy, but it is an open question whether it is enough or not to reach quantum advantage. And um, we, are, we are right here these days. And uh, the, last, the last step, which I show here, fault tolerance, this is the um, situation in which you are running algorithms with um, thousands of, of qubits and maybe hundreds of thousands of gates. And to run such long circuits on a quantum computer, um, you need to use something that's called um, error correcting codes, which is encoding multiple, um, which is using multiple physical qubits to encode one logical qubits. And the reason why you have to do this is because quantum gates, no matter how good they are, they will always have some finite error rate. So the, uh, in the language of quantum information, the fidelity of gates will always be finite. So it's not so obvious that you can run arbitrary long circuits with finite um, error gates, but it turns out that it is possible. All right. So we are moving closer to quantum simulation, moving closer to physics now. So one fact that I uh, wanted to mention is that in the last couple of decades, there, there's been a huge progress in the field of um, quantum simulation of quantum chemistry. So this, this application is seen as one of the most promising applications of, of near-term devices, of near-term devices, not quantum computers in general. So stuff like calculating uh, ground state energy of um, small atoms with very high precision, something like this. Um, and the second fact is, as was noted by um, Ken Wilson in one of his later works, um, the light front formulation of quantum field theory makes it in fact look similar to the orbital formulation of quantum chemistry. And so one of the idea behind our work is to use this similarity, basically to port all our knowledge about um, simulation of quantum chemistry into simulation of QFT. And uh, just a few more words about this big picture of what we do. So this is like this complexity scale or better say <coughs> resource requirement scale. So. If we want to do ab initio simulation, this will require fault tolerant devices and a lot of qubits, but we also can run something as soon as these days on a small quantum computer, and this will be just a benchmarking test. But it's very important, even if you're running an algorithm on two or four qubits, that you do it in a way that can be generalized to quantum advantage re regime, can be generalized to a setting where it would actually make sense to use a quantum computer. And so um, it's, this is like the key, the key point whenever you do some small simulation, the scalability. 
All right, so finally we are um, arrived to physics. So what is the front form formulation of quantum field theory? So as we take the QFT class in high school, study cross sections, um, propagators, all that stuff, we typically are taking the perspective of um, a massive observer. So we are describing physics um, using the reference frame. It can be a lab frame, it can be a uh, rest of uh, rest frame of some massive particle or center of mass frame. So these are all inertial reference frames of uh, massive particles and you can use Lorentz transformation to move between them. However, in the Minkowskian world, there exists a non-equivalent class of reference frames. Um, to put it simple, you can take the perspective of a massless observer or in a mathematical language, you are switching to light cone coordinates, equation six. Equation six looks very simple and it would be simple if it was written in the um, um, Euclidean world. But keep in mind that we're talking about Minkowskian world. So here X plus and X minus become, so if X naught here is time and X, X one is one of spatial coordinates, then X plus and X minus become two coordinates along the light cone. These are uh, those light-like directions. And uh, in principle, we can, uh, and this is a valid coordinate transformation. It's not a, uh, a Lorentz transformation, but it's a valid parameterization of whatever is of, of your Minkowskian space-time. Moreover, you can say that let's treat X plus as light cone time and X minus as another distance coordinate and let us evolve the system in the X plus direction. So the surfaces of constant evolution parameters will be the fronts of light. As, uh, as like shown on this right picture. So this gives the name to this formalism, front form. Um, as we shall shortly see, this perspective results in numerous advantages and we benefit from taking this perspective in many ways. Here, I just wanted to mention one of them. So if we are massless and we are moving with speed of light, let's say to the left, as shown in this picture, then nobody, can move faster than us to the left, right? We're already moving there with the speed of light. And all the massive particles, all the massive, uh, yeah, all the massive particles relative to us will move to the right, which implies that all the momenta of massive particles are strictly positive. And this is um, a very nice simplification, which will turn out to be particularly useful as we start talking about quantum simulation. All right, so here's, here we dive into the first chapter, which is the ab initio simulation. So first of all, um, I should say that uh, there exists quite a lot of um, efforts uh, in, in, in this field. So people do quantum simulation of quantum field theory. That's not something new. And we are aware of existing approaches. Most of these approaches are based on uh, lattice technique. So the idea is to discretize the space, so to put the, the field, the quantum field on a spatial lattice to discretize the field values, discretize the gauge group. If you have a gauge theory, discretize everything. Um, and this is a valid approach. And it was shown by Jordan and Preskill that you may reach quantum advantage if you do so, that in order to get uh, the desired precision, all your resources indeed do scale polynomially. Now, the problem with this is the qubit counts that you end up having for realistic theories are very large. And the estimate is very simple. If you're using, if you have a lattice simulation, the number of qubits you have will be proportional to the volume of your grid, right? So if you have say 20 by 20 by 20 lattice, the number of qubits you have will be at least 20 cube, right? On top of this, you also have some internal degrees of freedom, right? Because you have multiple fields with various uh, indices living in, in each point. So, if you proceed this way, you easily end up with qubit counts like hundreds of thousands or even millions of qubits. And the question we ask is, can you do anything useful with a fewer qubits? And uh, likely the answer is yes, we can do. Um, and the idea is to use the formulation of quantum field theory known as DLCQ, discretized light quant quantization, which amounts to doing two things. So first of all, using the light front Hamiltonian, 
right? So this is what I talked just two slides ago, which is evolving the system uh, in the light cone time direction. And the second idea is instead of using the spatial lattice to solve the system in the basis of Fox states to, to use the second quantized approach. So now I will um, illustrate this approach. So I will use the example from the original DLCQ paper equation eight. So this is the Lagrangian of Yukawa model in one plus one dimension, uh, single uh, real scalar field, um, Dirac fermion and Yukawa interaction. So we proceed as follows. So we say that X plus will be our time and we do the Noether procedure and derive conserved charges for the theory, which form the canonical set of commuting observables. So we have P minus, which corresponds to X plus translations. So this is sort of light front version of the Hamiltonian operator. You also have P plus, which is, uh, uh, which corresponds to X minus translations. That th th this would be light cone momentum operator. And you also have charge operator whose meaning is similar to what you have in equal time. Um, a small simplification. Once we assume that we quantize our system in a box of size L and we do so, then it's convenient to switch to dimensionless momentum operator called harmonic resolution. So P plus is two pi over L K. And uh, we also do a similar transformation to P minus the Hamiltonian. And from now on, when I say Hamiltonian, I will mean here H. Now, if you do the transformation, then K will, will be dimensionless, but H will have the dimension of mass squared. The reason why we call K harmonic resolution, uh, or not just simply um, dimensionless momentum, even though sometimes I will use this definition, is because one way you can think of K is that this is like the ratio of your box size to Compton wavelength of lightest particle in your system. Uh, in this presentation, I'll be mostly talking about bound state problems. So if you want to determine the spectrum of your theory, then you diagonalize the mass squared operator. And in equal time, this is spin off squared minus P1 squared. But in the light front, this is just P plus times P minus, or in terms of this dimensionless momentum, it's K times H, which is very nice because if you are working at a fixed total momentum, so all of your Fox state, they belong to the block of the same momentum, then it means that your mass squared operator is up to a number is simply proportional to the Hamiltonian. So at this moment, I need to tell you um, what does the Hamiltonian look like and what is this basis in which we're solving it. So the Hamiltonian of one plus one uh, the Yukawa model looks as follows. It's as usually in QFT or in quantum chemistry, it's a polynomial uh, of creation uh, and annihilation operators. Um, it's a bit unusual that you have a quartic term, even though we started from the Yukawa inter interaction. This is the price that you pay for switching to light cone coordinates. So this interaction would be non-local from the equal time perspective. Um, and uh, you can think of it that it corresponds to instant to the instantaneous boson propagation. But this is a minor, I would say minor price, minor complication that we uh, pay. And in fact, uh, equation 11 is a lot nicer than it seems at first. And we'll discuss it just in a couple of slides. Okay, so we are solving this Hamiltonian in the basis of Fox states, which are multi-particle states of the free theory. And a unique feature of light front quantization in one plus one dimension is that uh, if you're working at a fixed total momentum, that without the necessity of introducing any additional cutoffs, the Hilbert space turns out to be finite dimensional. And then once you uh, stick to a block of fixed charge, it's another, another simplification and even smaller block. So, how do we understand that the Hilbert space has finite dimension? Well, just let's consider an example. So let us consider all the Fox states of total momentum two and charge zero. So since um, the discretized momenta are just integers and they all are positive and they all are smaller or no, no larger than two because they all should sum up to two. There are just three options. So you just can have one fermion and one anti-fermion, each having momentum two. You may have two bosons of momentum one, 
or you may have one boson of momentum too, and that's it. So it's like you can you can do QFT using a three by three matrix. Of course, this will be a very qualitative uh, picture. You will, you know, ideally you would like to go to larger values of K, but still it's uh, it's a very very beautiful um, illustration, I think. Now for general K. Um, and any Fox state can be written as follows. We just list all the possible fermionic, antifermionic, and bosonic momenta and tell what the occupancies of all these modes are. And all the momenta, they sum up to some total uh, harmonic resolution and same, same thing for charges. Now, I would like to now ask a question. How many Fox states do we have for the fixed value of momentum and charge? And I'll tell you right away that this question is important because this will set up a lower bound on the number of qubits needed. Um, it is in fact very easy to make this calculation because uh, the asymptotic is given by, all, by purely bosonic configuration. So if you forget for a second about fermions and imagine we have just a bosonic theory, then every Fox state is just an integer partition of K, the, the harmonic resolution. And integer partitions, uh, the number of integer partitions of a number scales as exponent of square root of this number, exponent of root k. And equation 13 is something that we expected, right? Because this is a multi-particle quantum system. So the Fox state uh, dimension, uh, the Hilbert space dimension should scale exponentially. And uh, if we take the logarithm of equation 13, this way we get the absolute lower bound on the number of qubits required to encode such a state of fixed harmonic resolution. And uh, the logarithm of this will give us square root of k. And by the way, I should mention that all of my results will be listed, will be given in terms of k, because the way you think of k is something like uh, the momentum cutoff, or this is like the analog of your lattice size in, in equal time. OK, now we finally arrive to the quantum simulation. So the first step is sort of preparatory step actually is just encoding physical steps in a quantum computer. How do we encode a Fox state in a quantum computer? So one way, which is um, something I would say more natural or obvious, that's really the first thing that you would think about is to store, to use qubits to store occupancies of all the modes in your Fox state. And this is what is actually typically done in quantum chemistry. So in quantum chemistry, we only have fermionic um, orbitals, right? And it's very easy. You can just assign one qubit per each fermionic orbital. So zero or not per qubit is just whether the orbital is occupied or not. And you can do same thing in, in, this, in this model, right? We have fermionic modes, fermions and antifermions, but we also have bosonic modes. So to encode each bosonic mode, we'll need multiple qubits. So that's why you have k log k in 15. However, there exists um, an alternative approach, uh, a more efficient approach called compact mapping. So the idea in this case is instead of storing occupancies to store the quantum numbers, which in this case are simply momenta of only occupied modes. And um, let, let's count how many qubits you need in this case. So let's consider the worst case scenario. Let's consider a Fox state in which all the modes are distinct. So in equation 17, you have one fermion of momentum one, one fermion of momentum two, one fermion of momentum three, and so on, um, up, till, uh, until some, um, up to some capital I, the largest momentum. And all of these momenta, they should sum up to K, the total harmonic uh, resolution. Now, if they all sum up to K, then I scales as a square root of K. So the maximum number of occupied modes in a Fox state in this theory scales a square root of K. And if you, but if, but what we are storing the momentum of these modes, not the occupancies. I mean, for, for bosons, we would also store the occupancies because occupancy is not necessarily just one as for fermions, but we, we also store momentum. And to store momentum, you need multiple qubits. Uh, but since the maximum momentum is K, you need at most log K qubits to store each mode. So up to this logarithmic factor, the number of qubits in this scale scales as square root of k. And by comparing 15 and 16, you may think that, oh, that's not such a big improvement. Just a, you know, it's just a polynomial improvement. And in quantum computing, we always want to have those exponential improvements. What's actually great about equation 16 is that you should compare it to equation 14 here. 
So the absolute lower bound on the number of qubits is square root of k. And we nearly reached this bound using compact encoding. So we're doing just a little bit worse. So you could say that this is a nearly optimal encoding scheme. All right, so the next stage is simulation. So we wanna do stuff like time evolution, adiabatic state preparation. These are typical ingredients of quantum simulation. Um, so to move to this topic, let me first mention another thing, um, which is if we do our calculation within this Hamiltonian block of fixed harmonic resolution, so we, we are doing calculation using all the Fox states you, having same K, um, and if you imagine this matrix, which is exponentially large, it turns out that this matrix is extremely sparse, that most of its entries are zero and only polynomially many of them are non-zero. Uh, only the number of non-zero entries scales as K squared. Now, you should not be surprised that this matrix is sparse because, and, and by sparsity, I mean the number of non-zero elements in the, in the entry. It's, it's, it's fairly easy to guess that this matrix is sparse because just from the form of the second quantized Hamiltonian, if we look at this equation, we see that there are only polynomially many creation and annihilation um, operator monomials in this equation. So if you act with equation 11 on a given Fox state, you will end up having a linear a superposition of at most polynomially many Fox states. So it's always like that. What is a bit surprising is that the sparsity grows as k squared because here the last term, so you see it's, it's um, quadratic in k, uh, but you also have a delta function on momenta. So this gives you k cube terms naively. However, you have some additional cancellations, uh, which I, I mean, I did not write here the explicit form of the Hamiltonian, it would like take the whole page. But it turns out that it's even better than you would naively expect. So the, the sparsity of the Hamiltonian is only k squared. And here I show the um, exact upper and lower bounds on sparsity. And the reason this is so important for us is because the most efficient algorithms for um, time evolution and adiabatic state preparation, they are based on Hamiltonian sparsity. Um, in, to put it simple, um, the traditional way of um, simulating time evolution is called proterization. And within this approach, uh, you would start with a um, evolution operator. You would discretize it into small time steps and proceed in this following way. So basically, um, the behavior of your quantum computer, of, your, of, of a quantum state in a quantum computer, would mimic the physics happening in the real world. But in the sparsity-based algorithm, it's not like that. In the sparsity-based algorithm, you are literally doing your um, arithmetic quantumly. So in the sparsity-based algorithm, um, you are literally considering the evolution operator as a matrix, multiplying the column vector of a state and doing this quantumly. And why this is the, we will like this algorithm so much is because you can rigorously prove that these algorithms are optimal or nearly optimal. So basically, this is as good as you can do. Now, the last stage of, of the calculation is the measurement. And great thing about the light front formulation of quantum field theory is the ease at which you can extract information about physical observables directly from the wave function. So in other words, the measurement operators have very simple form. As an example, we consider part and distribution function which is the momentum distribution of partons inside a bound state. Um, if you do such a calculation on a lattice, then extracting information about PDF from lattice um, calculation can be quite a non-trivial thing. However, it turns out that on the light front, calculating PDF is almost the most trivial thing that you can do because on the light front, uh, the measurement operator for PDF is just the number operator. So you're literally measuring the occupancies of your qubits. That's the simplest thing you can measure. And, and, and these um, uh, pictures just illustrate to you the, the actual uh, PDFs of a proton for, for gluons and, and, and quarks. And um, the PDFs um, in, uh, in our toy model. So you see that um, 
if you're working at harmonic resolution k, this means that you discretize your fractional momentum x in uh, steps of size one over k, right? So here we have harmonic resolution 14 and uh, uh, this fractional x, fractional momentum x is um, divided into 14 steps. Um, I also wanted to say a few words about moving to high dimensional theories because so far I was only talking about one plus one D. So one thing is that as you move to high dimensions and you add transverse directions, you need to introduce the cutoff on transverse momentum. But luckily, this is the only cutoff that you have to introduce. Uh, more good news now. The using compact encoding turns out to be even more advantageous. And this I'll mention on my next slide. The Hamiltonians are still extremely sparse in theories like QCD and 3 plus 1. And of course, you have a lot more observables but those can be measured efficiently as well. So, so what do we have for compact encoding in high dimensions? So let's say we have uh, D special dimensions and D, D minus one um, transverse dimensions. So if you are using the direct encoding, uh, then the number of qubits you need for calculation will be just the size of the grid in the momentum space, right? So equation 20 is um, in this case, sort of um, an analog of, um, of, of, of this equation in, in the equal time. So in the equal time, we had a, a grid in the, in, the, in, 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 the, in the real space. And if we are doing the second quantized simulation, then uh, this would be uh, the grid in the momentum space. So this is just a product of momentum cutoffs, nothing special. Now, what if we use compact encoding now? Well, here, we, have, we benefit again. We benefit again from using the light front formulation because a unique and I would say highly non-trivial feature of the light front formulation is that all the modes, even the massless modes, such as gluons or photons, they all do necessarily carry a non-zero light cone momentum. So if you work at harmonic resolution K, then every mode in your state carries the light cone momentum of at least one, which automatically implies that you have at most K excited modes, no matter what your uh, transverse cutoffs are. And transverse cutoff, they <clears throat> only enter logarithmically into your equation because in the compact encoding scheme, we are storing the momenta in the binary form. And so equation 21 is a huge improvement over 20. Just uh, to give you an example, if we uh, again consider a 20 by 20 by 20 grid in the, in the real space and pick a QCD in three plus one um, dimensions as a theory, five flavors, three colors, full scale simulation, then we end up having of order of a thousand of qubits, uh, which is a lot better than hundreds of thousand qubits. Like this, is, this is still a lot, but this is uh, something that experimentally ho hope to get probably within a decade or so. And uh, I also want to mention that in these methods, you need a few more qubits, so-called ancillary qubits, that you need to uh, do calculations in the compact encoding scheme. But this is uh, not a big overhead over the number um, uh, this, of qubits that you need to store the state. OK, so this is a brief summary for this first part. So on the left, you see the advantages of um, the light front formulation. So you don't have ghost fields. You have linear equation of motion. And because of this, you have fewer degrees of freedom. For example, the Dirac spinner in four dimensions, instead of four degrees of freedom in equal time, only has two on the light front. And you have positive momentum in the light cone direction. And so all of these, they lead uh, to lower qubit counts. You have fewer degrees of freedom and you can store them more efficiently. The Hamiltonians are very sparse, which is good because it means that we can use sparsity-based simulation methods. And on the theory side, we have a simple form of measurement operators. And this naturally results in a simple form of qubit measurement operators. Uh, and there are many, many more um, advantages. So the moral, uh, the kind of punchline for, for this part is that we think it's a very promising direction um, of work to start from the DLCQ formulation of QFT to use compact mapping, sparse simulation methods. 
All right. So now I would like to move um, to the second part. It will be shorter. And here um, I will talk about the work that we did together with James and Xiaoyang. Um, so these are the near-term applications. So now our goal will be very precise and well-defined. We want to do some QCD on an existing device and QCD in three plus one dimension. So of course, this is a very ambitious goal and it will require us having a very efficient representation of quantum field theory. And such a representation is known. Um, it is basis light front quantization. And um, uh, this is the following thing. So unlike DLCQ, here we will start from the effective Hamiltonian, which will be tuned um, to the particular problem of interest. So for light mesons or for heavy mesons, we would use different Hamiltonians. We would still evolve the system in the light cone direction. So we're still using light cone coordinates. We're still using second quantized approach. But now, instead of using the plane wave basis, we would use um, a basis that would fit the particular problem better. And it, it's sort of even natural that if you are you know, describing a bound, bound state to not use the basis of plane waves, but use some different basis. Okay, so now I'll just give you a particular example of a calculation that we did for light mesons. So how do we reach this um, minimal, uh, minimal formulation of quantum field theory that can be later generalized? So first of all, we, is, we will restrict ourselves to the valence sector of the Fox state. So this will be a two-body problem, so essentially a quantum mechanical problem, no longer quantum field theory. However, I would like to emphasize right away that the methods we develop are generalizable to the multi-particle case. Now, since we are working in the valence sector, it makes sense to use the relative momentum coordinate to further reduce the um, qubit requirements. Um, the effective interaction that we use um, is the following. We have, um, so the Hamiltonian contains two terms, H naught, the exactly solvable part, and an additional interaction term, Nambuja Lassini interaction. So the, the free part, so called, or better say, not free, but exactly solvable part of the Hamiltonian consists of the two dimensional um, harmonic oscillator in the transverse direction and um, an additional uh, longitudinal confinement, which um, in the low energy limit, you can also think of as a harmonic oscillator. So in the low energy limit, this is like a 3D harmonic oscillator. And in fact, choosing a 2D harmonic oscillator potential uh, for the transverse uh, direction is something that is suggested by higher consideration. That's, that's something that's coming from ADS QCD correspondence. So this is uh, more than a smart guess. Now, the reason why it's uh, so good to uh, have such Hamiltonian is because we will work in the basis of eigenfunctions of H naught. And those, the um, harmonic oscillator harmonics, uh, they, they already incorporate some confinement. And that's why you can get very good results even if you truncate um, your, uh, your basis early. And this is precisely what we need. All right, so for the min absolute minimal choice of cutoffs, the light front Hamiltonian looks as follows. It's just a four by four matrix. So why is it four by four? Well, because we took the uh, momentum eigenfunctions to be in the ground state. And on top of this, we have uh, spin up and spin down for quark and anti-quark. So here, the NGL interaction uh, basically gives us the spin orbit on interaction between quarks. And the eigenvalues of these matrix are, the lowest eigenvalues are the pi and uh, rho meson uh, squared masses. So we would like to find those. Um, even though this problem is essentially quantum mechanical, our goal at some point is to reach multi-particle simulation. And for that, we will use second quantized formulation. So we want to rewrite um, our problem in a way that can be easily generalized to the multi-particle setting. And that's why this matrix I showed you, the way 
uh, we think of this matrix is that this is a matrix of single body interactions in the second quantized Hamiltonian. So, so far we only have this H1 term, but later we will also add multi-particle interaction. So that's just a good, um, like a uniform language. And at this point, I um, want to start talking about the quantum computational paradigm that we use in this case. So on existing devices, we cannot do time evolution or adiabatic state preparation. It's just too expensive. It requires too many gates. We cannot have so many gates. And um, the way we use, um, we will use uh, quantum computers in the next few years for sure is for running so-called variational quantum eigensolver algorithms. So those are hybrid quantum classical algorithms. What does it mean? So you have a classical computer, which is running um, some, um, basically the classical computer is minimizing a certain function, the cost function. And the quantum computer is used to evaluate this function for each set of parameters. So you have sort of a, a gradient search and in each point, you use quantum computer to evaluate the value of, of this function. Now, if we choose this function to be the expectation value of the Hamiltonian in a certain ansatz state, then the variational theorem tells us that the absolute minimum of this function corresponds to um, the ground state of the Hamiltonian. And uh, how, can we, how, how can we get a quantum advantage? Well, we, get, we can get quantum advantage in the situation where evaluating this expectation value on each step is exponentially expensive on a classical computer, but it's only polynomially hard on a, on a quantum computer. But still, still, this is a heuristic algorithm because there's no guarantee that this classical, um, this classical minimization will converge to the true ground state. But this is our hope. All right, so, so we have this four by four matrix and I will use two ways of encoding it in a quantum computer. The two ways precisely which I discussed before, direct mapping and compact mapping. So if we have direct mapping, then we have four, four fermionic states, four orbitals. Only one of them is occupied. Um, only one of them is occupied because we're using relative momentum coordinate. And so encoding it using four qubit looks like equation 28. Then to get the multi-qubit Hamiltonian, we would apply jordan wigner transformation to that second quantized Hamiltonian. And on a quantum computer, we would use the following circuit um, um, as an ANSAT circuit. So the circuit you see here, in fact, allows you to prepare an arbitrary superposition uh, with real coefficients of the form 28. Now, this particular circuit cannot be generalized to the multiparticle case, but we know the solution for the multiparticle case called unitary coupled cluster. And the second approach is the compact mapping. So in the compact mapping, we will encode the index of this occupied uh, mode in the binary form. So we have um, just four modes, zero, one, two, three, and we encode uh, this, this number in a, in a binary form. And this amounts to using just two qubits. So here we're using the full Hilbert space of a two qubit system. And equation 31 in the corresponding Hamiltonian. And the ANSAT circuit is uh, also a bit easier. It's just the arbitrary state preparation. So in fact, you can um, also use the circuit below to prepare an arbitrary arbitrary state of uh, form 30 with real coefficients. Okay, so here are the results of our minimization. So our goal is to find the ground state of this Hamiltonian, which is the squared pi and mass. And um, on this picture, you see on the x axis, the optimization step. So this is the steps of the classical minimizer. And on the y axis, you see the expectation value of the, of the Hamiltonian. And uh, a, bunch of, a bunch of colored lines. So let's go through these. So solid lines correspond to using the direct mapping and dash lines correspond to using compact mappings, mapping. The blue line, the blue line is calculating the expectation value of the Hamiltonian using the state vector representation. So there is no um, quantum computer involved whatsoever. This is just a benchmark test of our minimizer. We wanna make sure that the minimization algorithm works correctly, and it does. So we see that uh, both blue lines, they converge perfectly to the true ground state. Orange line is classical sampling. This is still done on a classical computer, but in this case, 
we are calculating the expectation value of the Hamiltonian using sampling from the exact probability distribution. And the reason I show it here is because this is basically the, what the performance of a perfect quantum computer would be. Because quantum computer cannot calculate amplitudes. Quantum computer can only sample from the probability distribution. And the best it can do is to sample from the exact probability distribution. And finally, green and red lines are the ones obtained from an actual um, IBM quantum computer. The green line, um, in, yeah, so green line is calculating expectation values on a quantum computer and red line is the same thing with some measurement error mitigation on top of this. So what are the results? Well, first of all, in all cases, uh, the minimization sort of works. The results converge with various errors. Um, in the compact mapping, the results are consistently better than in the direct mapping. So we can, we can go lower. And another interesting result is in the case of compact mapping, the circuit is short enough so that measurement error mitigation actually uh, makes an improvement of results consistently. Because you see that in the case of direct mapping, there's just too much noise. And you can't really say that measurement error mitigation helps you. So once we found the ground state, and finding the ground state means that we have a recipe to prepare the ground state. We do not have the amplitudes, but we know what those ansatz parameters are, so we can prepare the ground state again and again in a quantum computer. So once we know how to do this, we can also calculate other observables. Now, uh, we, we can calculate decay constant, mass radius, um, form factors. From form factor, we can get charge radius, and so on. The results with this observable are similar to, to those with finding the ground state of the Hamiltonian. So it's kind of working. The errors are, of course, a lot bigger than in the perfect case. And uh, the results in the compact mapping are better than in the case of direct mapping. And in the case of compact mapping, uh, uh, measurement error mitigation makes, make, makes, it, make, makes a big improvement. All right. So now I would like to wrap up my, my talk and uh, just tell you a few words about the future work. So, um, so one thing that we would like to do is on, the, on this ab initio uh, side to have a, um, a full simulation with time evolution, adiabatic stain preparation for some toy model. Of course, this will be done on a classical simulator because we do not have access to a full quantum computer, but that's very important because we want to know the exact gate count so that we could um, compare our results to other methods. Um, and Will Kirby is a graduate student in our group who is working on this. Now, so far, I was mostly talking about um, ground state problems, but no, oh, sorry, bound state problems. But another interesting direction is scattering. So Sultana Hadi from our group together with James Vary, and um, I'm also participating in this project, we are thinking how to uh, do scattering in the light front. We also want to improve estimates for real theories so that thousands thousand of qubits for uh, QCD I showed you can probably be improved by another factor of two or three. I also want to say that there is a, a whole number of um, theoretical issues they, which, which have to be resolved. So light front physics is an area of very active research. And uh, there is there's a lot of ac ac action there. A lot of activity people are working on things like renormalization, uh, zero mode problem, uh, vacuum condensation, so on. So that's, uh, uh, we, we kind of have to take this into account in our research. Um, in terms of observables, um, this is, uh, a nice, a nice illustration of, I would say, what we can do on a quantum computer, but that we that, that we cannot um, do by any any other means. Which is um, so numerous observables that we have in um, in QFT, such as pattern distribution functions, uh, form factors, transverse momentum distribution, generalized pattern distribution. They can all be thought as um, let's say restrictions of some very general uh, observable called um, generalized transverse momentum distribution. And this is not something that you can get um, from, um, from an experiment. At, at least I think right now people 
do not know how to design such an experiment from which you would get all the things right away. But this is something that in principle can be done on a quantum computer. So this would be a very nice ab initio simulation giving you right away access to all, all of these observables. Um, these are our plans for um, on, on the near term side. So we finished our uh, Pion project in which we had a simulation in the valence sector. And now we would like to move on to multi-particle simulation. And there are a couple ideas what to do here. One is the, uh, to study quantum electrodynamics. Um, another is to start studying QCD. So uh, to, to do this, we needed some, some, some preparation. Um, and, uh, but I, I think we're now ready to, to move to these experiments. Um, on, the, on this near-term side, I would say there is still a number of very interesting open questions which need to be resolved. One of them is generalizing unitary couple cluster to the multi-particle setting, because unitary couple cluster was uh, originally used in systems where the number of particles is conserved. Another very interesting, um, um, I would say, a recent achievement is that until probably a few weeks ago, like. A month ago, nobody still knew how to generalize the compact encoding approach to the multi-particle systems, at least in the near term. But now this problem has been reserved, uh, resolved. So we are very optimistic that uh, probably we can run near term multi-particle uh, simulations using compact encoding. So um, a, lot of, a lot of interesting dire uh, directions to, in which to go. Uh, so hopefully, um, it was interesting for you to hear about those. So I would like to thank you all for, for your attention. Um, and uh, if you have any questions, please ask. Well, well thank you, Michael, for <clears throat> this um, very fine uh, presentation. Um, before we open it up to questions, I just want to remind everybody that, uh, first of all, the uh, recording of Michael's talk is being made and will be made available um, from our seminar series uh, website or th through YouTube uh, with um, Bo's uh, updates on future uh, talks contain information on where you can find these uh, videos. Also, uh, my, uh, Michael, if you'd kindly share the slides themselves, that could be a sure. more, more compact form of sharing in information with those who are interested. Okay, very good. Let's open it up for questions uh, from the audience then. Anyone want to unmute their microphone, they can ask uh, Michael a question. Maybe I could go ahead and get the ball rolling then, uh, Michael. Um, <clears throat> when you presented um, the Hamiltonian, uh, the most compact version of your Hamiltonian in one of your applications, it had about, uh, yeah, well, that's the matrix version. And, and there you'll notice that this being a four by four, my question will be based on the fact that this matrix um, is symmetric. So it has actually uh, 10, I know, four plus three plus two plus one. So they, yeah, 10 unique numbers. Okay, now go to your compact uh, matrix form. Uh, not that, that's right. Okay, so now equation 31 shows you've written the Hamiltonian in terms of what amounts to five uh, unique numbers. So could you explain in a few words how that reduction of information uh, uh, is feasible? Okay, yeah, that's, um, I actually, <laughs> yeah, I actually skipped this point, so <laughs> it's good you asked it. So I pronounced on the previous slide the way I obtained equation 29, right? So I said that I, started from the second quantized Hamiltonian from this guy. And I applied a Jordan Wigner transformation to each, to each term here. So for each bi dagger bj, it was mapped on some other qubit operator in this approach. Now in the compact mapping, uh, I, I was using, a, I would say a brute force approach. So the way I obtained equation 31 
is the following. So in this case, we have a two qubit system, right? We have a two qubit system and an arbitrary observable, any observable acting on two qubits can be um, written in the following form is just the sum with some coefficient pi times pj, where each pi is, is some poly matrix, one, x, y, z, right? So any, any, any observable acting on a, acting on a, on two, a, any observable on, a, on two qubits is just a uh, linear combination of these, these guys are called, so these are poly matrices and these we call poly terms, just simply poly terms. So, so what I did is I, I simply um, calculated the matrix representation of each of these guys, which is a matrix of size four by four. And then I decomposed my four by four Hamiltonian in this basis. So in other words, I was taking traces. So alpha ij is just the trace of my Hamiltonian matrix H multiplied by pi pj, something like this. Now, this approach is very, this approach would not work for the multi-particle setting or better say it would work, but it would be exponentially expensive. So in the multi-particle case, the analog of equation 31 would contain exponentially many poly terms. Mm -hmm. So this, this is not something that can be generalized in a straightforward way, but it can be generalized to the multi-particle case. And this is what I was talking about here. So this, so basically we can measure the expectation value without of the Hamiltonian, without writing it as this linear combination of poly, poly matrices using these um, sparse, sparse methods uh, developed by Peter and Will recently. So in a way, this is more, this way of, of measuring expectation values of the Hamiltonian is more similar to the way we do simulation of time evolution and adiabatic state preparation. So this relies on those sparsity-based methods. And it's not simply uh, decomposing Hamiltonian in terms of, of like poly terms, because we have exponentially many of those. Basically each creation and annihilation operator, like just, just, just a single creation operator, if you have a multi-particle state, it will be a sum of exponentially many terms. So this is inefficient right away. Okay. But, but, they, they, but they exist an approach to doing it efficiently in a more subtle way. Very good. So let me ask if other people have questions. So I always have. Go ahead. So to, uh, for, so to be clear, we, we're, we are decomposing our a matrix, a Hamiltonian, into uh, poly matrices, um, uh, and which in, in turn are being represented by gates. Uh, so our Hamiltonian, so to speak, is a uh, is represented by a some configuration of gates on qubits, right? Is that uh, correct? No. <laughs> uh, so let, th that's a good question because I actually skipped this part. I did not uh, say it in um, enough detail. So, um, yeah. So this is. Um, how we um, calculate the, the expectation value of the Hamiltonian. So we write, we do the following thing. So the Hamiltonian, the poly Hamiltonian already at the level of individual qubits, we write it at the sum of poly operators, right? Some, let's say, C, I, those P, I, where P, I is a tensor product of poly matrices. So this equation is, what, what I show here, equation 29. So this is my qubit Hamiltonian. Um, 
in order to calculate the expectation value of equation 29, what we do is we repeatedly calculate the expectation value of all these polyterms individually. So we first calculate the expectation value of this guy, the expectation value of this guy, and so on in the same state. So in fact, the one, one step, one minimization step, which is evaluating the Hamiltonian expectation value for a fixed set of parameters, will look as, would look as follows. First of all, we calculate the expectation value of this guy in this state. So we run this circuit that you see on the bottom. And then here, what is the first guy? Uh, the first, let's, let's pick something easier. Let's say this guy. Let's say, I, I, want, I want to calculate the expectation value of this guy. So if I want to calculate the expectation value of this guy, then I will just measure this very last qubit, right? Because I only need to know uh, the z, z, z uh, projection of this last qubit. All right. Mm -hmm. And then if I need to measure something like this, I would need to add um, here a couple more gates. So probably I add one more gate here, something like Y rotation probably or X rotation here and here, and then measure all the four qubits. So basically, I'm for each of these polyterms, I'm running the same circuit. And then there is another layer of gates, which defines my measurement operator. So if I measure Z, I'm doing nothing. If I'm measuring X or Y, I'm just making a rotation to that basis. So I have the same circuit for each poly operator, plus on top of this, a slight change of basis. So in, in a way, the, the operator that we measure, yeah, it, it affects the circuit, but only at the very last step. Okay, I, I think I see now. Uh, that, makes a, that, that makes a lot more sense. <laughs> Yeah, that's, I, I should have. Uh, I, 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 I suspect it was just me misunderstanding something. No worries. Um, by the way, we have a question uh, in the chat box. Michael, can you read the chat box or do you want me to read um, it to you? I think I can open it. Yeah. Did you group the poly operators in a video way to decrease the cost of evaluating the expectation value? Yeah, good question. Actually, there is a lot of, a lot of research on how to. Um, optimize the calculation at this stage. For example, many of these poly terms are commuting with each other. And, and uh, you know that uh, if you have a bunch of commuting operators, it means that you can measure all of them right away. But in this particular example, I, I was not doing any, any, optimi any optimization at all. So in this case, I literally measured, well, here it's like 16 or 17, uh, 17 operators. Well, the only optimization I did, I was not measuring this term. <laughs> because this is just a trivial term whose expectation value is known. But um, no, here I did not group my poly operators in, in any way. But in general, we expect that we may have a polynomial improvement, which is, which is good and important by various way of, of reshuffling these operators, changing bases, and, and doing stuff like this. And uh, some members of our group work on it. Uh, Peter and Andrew will... So maybe I have one more question. Um, the um, cost of doing a calculation in BLFQ, the basis light front quantization, in part depends on the cost of evaluating the Hamiltonian matrix itself. So when you, in, your, in your demonstration, you start with that being right. a given. Um, yes. But in, as we imagine a future in which the... Uh, the basis space becomes super large. Um, at some point, I think we have to begin to worry about the cost of evaluating the matrix elements themselves, the entries, the entries in this matrix. Um, and that may require a separate uh, development in quantum computing, unless, unless you already have a good idea. And, and maybe the, the most recent paper you're pointing to is actually a key to that, because there you're just using the what I might call the primitive matrix elements of the starting Hamiltonian, which is expressed in second quantized form, rather than the uh, full-blown many-body matrix elements shown in equation 25. But, well, 
in, in this in this in this second quantized Hamiltonian here, I also assume that these coefficients h h i j are known, right? So I already took this as as input. Okay, so that is that still is that is still an open question. Yeah, still an open question, uh, and would require perhaps yeah. separate thinking and development on how to make it efficient to create the needed HIJs to begin the problem. Right. That's right. the complica That's the price we pay for switching from DLCQ to BLFQ. Right. That's right. right. Because in DLCQ we we have very few very few constants and. Uh, well, even in DLCQ, the cost of evaluating the many body uh, matrix elements is not necessarily trivial. It's less, less complicated because they're bosons rather than fermions. But with fermions, there's sign issues that enter. Yeah. Right? And that, that means rather more, more involved calculations could be, in, could be uh, uh, and, and, it, and it's interesting that if we're using the direct encoding, then this is all done classically. So then these are just 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 some parameters of our gates. But Correct. in the compact encoding, we do all this arithmetic quantumly. We do evaluate all those coefficients using this binary logic, but sort of binary logic using quantum gates. Yeah. Okay. Good. I, I see another question in, in the chat. Um, uh, from which you do, can you comment on the circuit design and what is the typical way of designing? So I guess I'll move to this question. Um, so let me first comment on the circuits that I used here. So the circuit you can, with that I used for direct encoding, which is preparing uh, this state of the of form 28, uh, this is, I sort of stole the circuit or maybe optimized um, a very nice result for preparing the so-called W state. So the W state is defined as um, the sum of all these states with uh, equal coefficients. And the, in this case, the circuit turns out to have logarithmic depths. So in this circuit, I, if, I, if I have n, n qubits, then I will have two n um, gates. So, but, but only log, 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 uh, log n depth circuits. So this is all very nice, but this is also nice only because I have just uh, one occupied orbital. Um, as I said, the way you generalize uh, this direct mapping approach to the multi-particle case is called unitary couple cluster. And the idea is that the, um, um, let me draw here. So in the unitary couple cluster, the ansatz state has the following form. It's a unitary operator U of theta, which looks roughly uh, like, so it looks something like this, E to the power T minus T dagger and operator T is similar to the Hamiltonian. So it has the same coefficients as you have, um, same, same operator form as, as your Hamiltonian. So something like B dagger I, B dagger J plus JKL. So this is what people use in, in quantum chemistry. And, and again, this is, this is still the, um, uh, the heuristic method. So there, there, there's no, no, there's no guarantee, but um, in quantum chemistry, it sort of works. And our setting is very similar to quantum chemistry. So, I mean, I, 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 I was, I was playing, playing with this um, on the classical simulator, and it was working just fine. Now, if we use compact encoding, I would say this is now, this now becomes a, really an open question. Um, it's really. Uh, a matter of like trial, trial and error, because yeah, in the compact ma mapping approach, we sort of did half of the job. We 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 know how to do measurements uh, in the multi-particle case, but there is no well-known working ansatz for the multi-particle case in the compact encoding. So I would say there's a uh, so wonderful opportunity to give undergraduate students summer projects. 
<laughs> in my opinion, <laughs> just to play with various various algorithms. So like they, they, they exist uh, well known uh, and that circuits which are not have nothing to do with particle physics, just various layers of parametric gates and stuff like this, but that's not something that taken physics into account. So this is largely an open question. Well, great, Michael. <clears throat> Thank you very much. Um, we run just a little bit over, but it was a very stimulating presentation and discussion. Um, I want to thank Michael for taking the time to develop the talk and make it as pedagogical as he did. Um, I think there are many possible research pathways you've you've talked about. Um, so uh, let's continue uh, dialoguing together. And uh, I think some of our students are beginning to investigate some of these avenues and may have follow up questions for you about your talk and. I would say if you're great, open great. to that, Michael, yeah, that's they, great. they could send you directly uh, email questions as yeah, they maybe. develop those thoughts later. We have several students attending.